past this old house, I'll show you how to turn this reclaimed beam into a fireplace mantle. You like it? Looks amazing, Nathan. Change not a laugh, boss. It might be something you could try. I'll take you through the steps. I rolled my eyes when I first saw this wrench, but I've really fallen in love with it. And in Future House, I'll see how geothermal is becoming more affordable for the average homeowner. You're basically hammering the ground at 9,000 times a minute, which allows the ground to actually vibrate so fast that it actually becomes like a jello, which allows you guys to drill through the earth so quickly. Correct. One of my favorite things to do on the weekend is actually head over to the flea market. So a lot of people think that flea markets are for antiques or collectibles, but actually I find a lot of my tools there. I've bought framing guns, hammers, even fasteners. So it's a great place to go and collect those things that I can save some money on. Another great thing you can find at the flea market is old building materials. You can clean them up and give them a new life in your home. And this homeowner who rode in intends to do just that. Hey, Nathan, good to see you. Hey, Greg, is this the beam you wrote me about? Yes, it is. Oh, that's great. Where'd you pick it up from? So I picked up the Brimfield Fair a little while ago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, How much you pay for it? I paid $40 for it. Oh, that's a great deal. You could have paid a couple hundred bucks for something like this at a really? shop. Yeah, that's why I love the flea markets. You really can't get the best deal there. So, any history come with it? Uh, so, the guy I bought it from said he um, got it from a barn up in Vermont that they were salvaging. Oh, very cool. Yeah, you can tell it's very old. It's got the hand-hewed front. You know, they cleaned it up with, uh, with the axe, and it's even got a nice check down the front. It's got a lot of character to it. What do you plan on doing with it? Um, so my thought is I want to make it into a new mantle above my fireplace. Nice. Um, so I started cleaning it up mm -hmm. and um, getting it looking good, and that's kind of where I got stuck on figuring out how I need to mount it. Do you have anything up already? I do. I have one I can go show you. All right, let's take a look. All right, so this is the mantle you want to swap out, right? Yes, it is. Okay. So at first glance, I can notice it's pitching off a little bit, and it looks like it's hung light duty, just a couple of plastic shields. So I think we can really stiffen this up with that new beam. It's going to look sharp. Great, yeah. Definitely add a lot more character to the room, too. Definitely. Let's uh, drop this one off. We'll grab some measurements and cut the beam. Sounds good. Okay. All right, you're free. Great. Looks good already. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we want to do is place the beam. We want to be far enough away from the firebox, and we also want to be centered in the chimney. What we're gonna do is we're gonna drill some holes and we're gonna put some threaded rod into it. But we don't wanna go through the center of the brick because most likely these are cord bricks, meaning there's little holes inside. We'd be better off and it'll be stronger to go through the mortar bed. Okay. Uh, what I'm gonna do is drill three holes onto the fireplace. I'm gonna drill three holes onto the back of the beam and then we'll slide it right on. Sounds good. All right, so I wanna be centered in the fireplace. So I'm gonna use the bricks to help find my center. I got a joint right in the middle. That's a good place to start. And then off that, 16 and three quarter this way. And 16 and three quarter this way. Now we just wanna make sure it's level. I'm gonna drill quarter inch pilot holes to make it easier to drill in with the larger bit. Greg, why don't you follow me in with the HEPAVAC to keep the dust down? I want the epoxy to bond really well with the mortar, so I'm gonna try and clean out all the fine dust particles. I like epoxy in this application because it's really good at bonding different materials. We have the steel going to masonry, and also it's got a really good tensile strength on it. All right, so now we wanna make sure that these are projecting out 
a little bit higher than level and then lower level across. Okay. So I'll bring this up close and then you put the level on. Yeah, that's good. All right, now that we have our threaded rod inserted, we can give that epoxy some time to cure. In the meantime, we can cut our beam to length. It's pretty long, so we're gonna wanna cut it down. Might as well use the width of the fireplace, 58 and a half inches, It'll look pretty clean. We could use a circular saw to cut this, it would be pretty quick, but I thought it'd be pretty cool to actually use a two-person cross-cut saw. Like oh, wow. This. Got this from my grandfather's house, and uh, it might take us a little longer, but the beam has a lot of character, you know, the hand hew, the check, that end's a little bit rougher. Maybe kind of cool to give the same detail on the other end. Are you down for that? Sounds great. All right, let's give it a try. All right, nice start, nice and slow. Give it a little score. Awesome, well that was easy. <laughs> I like how it matches the other end, like how they would have done it years ago. So this is the back side, we're gonna do our layout, but I noticed that this check mark has kind of formed a little bit of a ridge. Nothing too bad, but I'd like to take it down with my block plane before we bring it inside and hang it up. That way when we put it up against the wall, it doesn't roll or teeter at all. Okay. All right, so we pulled our dimensions from right to left. First hole is 13, second hole 29, three quarter. And last hole is 46 and 5 eighths. All right, so we got our holes drilled. It looks good, we did a dry fit. Now it's time for some finish. Um, back in the day, a lot of people used tongue oil. It's great, adds a nice natural finish, uh, brings out the good wood tones in it. Oh wow, yeah, I can already see a difference. Yeah, that's a good look. Now how many coats do we need to apply? Well, we're gonna do one coat to start. We're gonna let it set for about 15 minutes and then we'll strike it off with a lint-free rag. And then if you want to, and after 24 hours, you can apply a second coat. Okay, and repeat the same process, wipe it off. Yep. What do you think? Wow, that looks really good. You all can right. definitely see all the nice character and the different tones in the wood. Great, it's had some time to soak in. Just strike it off and uh, aim for these high, high glossy spots, especially the knots. They don't really soak in the tongue oil as much, but just hit it evenly. Okay, what we'll do. All right, we're all set. We've got the tongue oil on it. The dry fit looks good. So all we need to do now is fill up the back voids with some fast curing epoxy. We'll bring it in and hang it up. Okay. All right, right we've got them filled up about three quarters of the way. Okay. Plenty of room for the rod to go in. So we're, we're done. We can bring it inside and hang it up. Wonderful. All right, let's do it. All right. So threaded rod is nice and hard, yep. bring it up. All right. Nice and slow, nice, good fit. You like it? I do, yeah, this looks amazing, Nathan. Awesome, one more coat of tongue oil and it'll be good for a while. Glad you like it. Yeah, no, cut perfect of size, nice and level. Thank cool. you so much. You're welcome. Yep, that looks awesome. Beautiful bean, really <laughs> and cool. Nice to have the uh, crosscut saw in your repertoire. Yeah, we, I've been gifted a lot of tools over the years and actually brought a few of them with me today to show you. Um, here's some of the tools guys would have been using back in the day to quickly square lumber or make sizable lumber, you know, build a house with. Yeah, let's be honest, nothing quick about it, right? No, no, a no. A lot of work. Very time consuming. Here we have a draw knife. A lot of guys would have been pulling bark off, letting the beams dry, letting the logs dry. Here's an ax with a single bevel, good for cleaning up the edge of a log. Uh, of course, a two-man cross-cut saw, a small adds, and here I have a larger adds, which yep. this is a great tool to have. People still like to use them. It's a quick, efficient way to square lumber. You can make a flat side. I actually brought a log with me if you want to see how yeah, it works. I would love to see this thing in operation. So you brought us, what is this wood? I brought some red cedar. Okay. 
So with this, you really want to be safe because you're swinging an axe blade towards yourself. So you're just going to do short, choppy strokes. And the whole goal is just take little pieces out. Clearly effective in cleaning it up, um, but also if you could stop for a second, yeah. you, know, you can see where those sort of telltale signs come from when you find those hand-hewn logs. Yeah, you can see those big nicks. So we're starting to pull out big flakes here. I might even have to reverse and come to an, on the other way to pull off some of these. Well, Nathan, it really makes you appreciate how much effort goes into that whole thing. It does. It's exhausting. And the thing I'm thinking is that uh, Greg really had a deal buying his for 40 bucks yeah. already hewn. Yeah, he did. A great deal. All right, thanks. Richard? I thought we would talk about changing out the basic lavatory bathroom faucet. Okay. You know, it, might, it might be worn out. You just might want to upgrade the look of it. Yeah. All right, so it's a pretty straightforward project, uh, and there's some basic connections, okay? We've got a water supply connection. We've got a connection right here that connects the water supply to the shank of the faucet. Yeah. And then we have the connection right here that makes the, the faucet latch on or bolt stay on to the sink or countertop. Gotcha, all right, so let me right. go. Let's show, show the process. There's one thing that's really important before you do any of this work, yeah. and that is to shut the water off. Any shutoff's gonna close with righty tighty, lefty loosey, so you turn it by hand. If you can't turn it by hand, actually this wrench is actually designed to also fit over the, the end of that shutoff. Just be careful not to over torque on old work. That pipe might not be secured Absolutely. to a stud or something and like that. Old. Right. Okay. So now you want to have some sort of rag or catch pan, because it's gonna be just the water that's sitting in these legs right here. Now, that's the easy part. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's happened is up underneath here are these connections. Okay, so you can see that that nut and the lock nut, and there's no room to get wrenches up in there because you really have got to get sort of underneath and up this way. Right. But, and then this turns out to be one of the great inventions. It's designed to be able to come up and it fits exactly. Now you've got the torque. You've got added torque by being able to use your hands to loosen it, or you can put a screwdriver in here or a wrench mm. and loosen it and get it, oh, you can get up in that. there. It drops it right out. You only have to break your knuckles three times <laughs> yeah, before right. you invest in one of those. I'll get this side. Okay. Kevin, just take the old faucet out. Yep. Got that. All right. I love to make a watertight connection with plumber's putty. The thing about this is it it, any imperfection in the sink, it'll it'll fill that crack or mm -hmm. just make a nice watertight connection. Why don't you put that up inside? And I'm going to catch the nuts. Push this down a little yeah. bit. Yeah, hold it. I'll let you tighten it the rest of the way. Okay. I'm going to snug them up. You see that squeezing out? I do. And I'm going to use that same wrench. To start reversing the process. All right, so that's essentially the water connections to a new lav faucet. Only thing left to do is the lift rod that'll make that stopper go up and down. Yep, and as you said, not hard. Any homeowner can do it. We hope so. All right, thank this you, Richard. Did, this didn't hurt. When you're looking for renewable ways to fuel your home, it's hard to beat geothermal heat pumps, at least in theory. Just below our feet, the earth is always at a consistent temperature of about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Using a looped pipe filled with water or antifreeze, you can tap into that constant temperature. In the summer, that well can be a place to dump excess heat. And in the winter, heat can be pulled out of the ground. That same system can also provide hot water for your showers and your dishes. It's incredibly efficient and requires no fossil fuels. So why isn't geothermal as common as solar or wind? For one thing, drilling a well can get very expensive. Some of it's because you don't know what's below your feet when you start drilling. It could be soft like this, or it could be hard as a rock. It's also typically a messy process that involves big equipment that doesn't fit in every yard. Today, I'm headed to Albany, New York to see the evolution of geothermal that may allow it to get deployed to many, many more houses. Ross, welcome to our drill site. Thomas, thanks for having me. 
When I think of geothermal though, I am not thinking about established neighborhoods with small lot lines. I mean, I'm thinking usually major renovations, new construction, large projects. This is unique. This used to be the, the case up until now. What we're trying to do is bring geothermal to residential neighborhoods. And to be able to do that, we have to design uh, for modularity and be able to squeeze into really tight spaces. So you see how the drill is in place now. The casing is vertical. Mm -hmm. So we're about to commence with sonic drilling, oh. right? And what sonic drilling does is oscillate that casing vertically at up to 150 hertz. And that is 9,000 vertical beats per minute. So if I get a recap here, you're basically hammering the ground at 9,000 times a minute, which allows the ground to actually vibrate so fast that it actually becomes like a jello, which allows you guys to drill through the earth so quickly. Correct. Right now, and we are adding an additional 10 foot of casing okay. to the drill string, and you'll see that we are running 10 foot casing lengths as opposed to 20 foot casing lengths, okay. and that's gonna help us make the entire system more compact. Got it, so if you were using 20 foot casings, this truck would be a lot larger. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. With this sonic system, we are able to install the casing all the way down to bedrock in 30 minutes. A conventional system could take up to seven hours to install the same diameter casing to the same depth. Wow, that is a significant difference. And they will not be able to extract that casing. Every piece of casing that you see on our pipe handler right now has been used on previous projects. We have not replaced a single set of casing. This allows us to bring down the cost even further for the ground loop installation. So the six inch casing has made its way down 82 feet, lodged itself into bedrock, and now they're switching to another drill rig. Exactly, and that's going to have a down the hole hammer, uh, which we call the DTH, and it's going to be drilling through the center of this six inch casing all the way to bedrock, and then from bedrock all the way through to the total depth which is the design depth for this well. This uh, well is going to be a 300 foot well and this project will have two of those 300 foot wells. Gotcha. While we are drilling, you'll see that all of the uh, rock chippings and mud and swale that is uh, excavated from this hole will have to come up the hole. And instead of dumping it all on the customer's yard, we are transferring that to our mud processing unit. And our mud processing unit will be able to separate um, the solids from the liquids. And this enables us to recycle the water and reuse this same water over and over again and clean that water to within 30 microns, which is about a thousandth of an inch. So I can see the loop rig coming in. I, I see the high density polyethylene pipe being lowered into the, into the borehole. I also see another pipe coming in at the same time. What's that pipe for? That is the coil tubing pipe, and that's gonna enable us to grout from the bottom up, which is an underwater grouting technique. That will become a column that will have really good contact with the earth for really good efficiency. Correct, and this grouting or concreting um, uh, layer around it has two purposes. The first purpose is to conduct heat from the soil to the ground loop and the second purpose is to ensure that no um, pollution or impurities can actually penetrate the soil towards the aquifers. All right so now we have completed our drilling, looping and grouting which means the geothermal loop has been installed right and this will be linked towards the inside of the house and Brian Zimmerly is uh, uh, inside working on that system right now and he'll be able to show you all the magic inside. So Brian, I design a lot of geothermal systems and they typically require a custom solution, right? High-end residential, it's, you know, it's a different market. So tell me about the innovation, what you guys are working on here. Absolutely, yeah. So one of the steps that we've done right off the bat is standardize a lot of the way that we design and engineer the systems. We're reusing any in existing infrastructure that we can. So in this case, the existing air ducts. Gotcha, okay. Um, and so you can see here, we've cut off the existing ducts and added our new system in and just added these flexible duct so connectors. So it's pretty much plug and play, right? Plugging it in here, connecting between the supply and the return. Exactly, so the home used to have an air conditioner outside, natural gas furnace inside. What we've done is pulled that old unit out, coil, condenser, furnace and we've capped the natural gas lines. 
and now we've got one single geothermal unitary system. So no more outdoor condenser. No more outdoor condenser, which is great. Yeah, and you'll notice too that one of the things you'll typically see in a geothermal system is a separate uh, pump box mm -hmm. that has your pumps and some of the flushing ports in it. We've put all of that into one unit to make the, the installation process that much faster and smoother. And installing things in a factory is much faster than doing it in the field. Sure. And so what you'll see here, what we've got is two pumps that pump uh, through this piping and out to our geothermal well. Mm -hmm. And it's pumping a mixture of water and a little bit of glycol just to account for any possible freezing conditions. Okay. And so that water then is moving through a heat exchanger inside the tank or inside the unit yep. that uh, exchanges with the refrigerant that's all self-contained inside the box. Gotcha. So on the air side, I see the return duct coming in here. Exactly. What happens next? Yeah, so this is just like any typical uh, system where you, you're pulling uh, return air across a, a refrigerant coil that the fan is pulling and pushing out through the rest of your existing ductwork. Got it. So in the you know, wintertime, when the air is cold, it's coming in right across that coil, warming up, and then being delivered to the supply duct into the space. Exactly. And then it's just a continuous cycle where we're then going back and getting more heat from the ground and pulling it back to your heat That's exchangers. Great. That's great. Awesome. What about the blue piping? Yeah, you'll notice that we've got this extra piping here that this is going over to heat your hot water for things like showers or dishwashing. Right, so domestic water. Exactly. Okay. Really exciting. It is exciting. Now, in a house like the one we just installed in, what's the out-of-pocket expense for that homeowner? Yeah, average out-of-pocket for a home like that would be anywhere from 18000 to 22000 That home coming in around 19000 Okay. Now, that's less expensive than a traditional geothermal system, but that's still really expensive. Yeah, so we're taking a play out of the book of solar, and you know, a decade or so ago, solar on rooftops was really expensive. And what we're doing is uh, providing financing similar to the way solar did, where we take away that upfront cost. So the homeowner has zero out of pocket on day one, and you replace that with a fixed monthly fee. So they start seeing savings from day one. Gotcha. And what that means is that now they get heating, cooling, and some of their domestic hot water with a, for a fixed monthly rate that's lower than what they would be paying for their utilities otherwise. Gotcha. Yeah. And it should be added that the homeowner owns the geothermal system. It's an asset that they can amortize over the lifetime, and that adds value to their real estate. Yeah, that's a great point. I'm a big fan of geothermal, and I'm glad you guys are making it more accessible. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Ross. Thank you. Next time on Ask This Old House. Landscape lighting is really a great way to make your yard design pop. I'll show you how to install it. So we're gonna start at our furthest point, and start tucking the wire in. The next thing is we're gonna stuff the wire into the trench we dug and start backfilling as we go. So this was one of the first projects I did at the house. Right. And as you can see, it's a little choppy. This walkway was installed in a hurry and it shows, but I'll show you how to do it the right way. 